Um, so, uh, Ryan, I wanted to key off of something that you had mentioned earlier. You were talking about the existing framework. And so um, I I'm going to ask Scott perhaps the only question we'll be comfortable answering uh, tonight, which is when we're talking about the existing framework for doing non-registered offerings, um, there's probably a lot of people in the audience who, like, they might have heard someone say RegD once, um, but they probably don't understand it. Like, could you maybe walk us through some of the simple exemptions here? No, sorry. Uh, yeah, happy to. Um, just quickly, just kind of take a, a poll. Who are lawyers in this room? Okay, all right. Entrepreneurs that are not lawyers. Uh, okay. Um, I, I think this could be pretty, pretty, pretty brief because half the room are attorneys. Um, so, uh, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, you know, the threshold question here for the securities law framework is, is whether or not we're talking about a security. Uh, to the extent that we are, um, under the, uh, the, the current framework, the offer and sale of the security and the resale um, must be registered with the SEC or find uh, an applicable exemption. Um, most, I believe, DIRA produced a report in the last six months, six to nine months, um, where. Uh, and what was uh, that's our, that's, that's our, our, our economists, um, and they, they produced a report that kind of delineated between the different exempt offerings and, and how popular they were, um, both by, I think, in terms of offerings, well as dollars, um, and the Reg D 506B, um, uh, 506, by the way, the, the way the securities law framework functions, um, under 4A2 is the exempt offering statute, um, and the Reg D has a, a series of rules that provide safe harbor for for um, adequately satisfying uh, a board to offer. Um, Reg D has uh, several exemptions in it, one of which being 506B, um, where an unlimited amount of capital can be raised. Um, however, recognizing that for the blockchain space, ICOs, um, and the way that ICOs generally are promoted, um, through what, what we would generally consider to be a general solicitation, 506 uh, issuers could not avail themselves of 506B because. A little louder. Uh, there we go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, okay, so 506B would not really work um, <coughs> under most of the ICOs, uh, under many ICOs that have been observed uh, due to the general so the, the inability to um, generally solicit. 506C, however, um, does uh, does allow for general solicitation, um, and uh, the, the, the issue there the, for the ICO community is that um, likely the, the sale must be to accredited investors. Um, recognizing Twitter feeds and such are uh, not huge on the accredited investor standards, um, I recognize that that might cause some people to be heartache in this room. Um, in addition, there are a couple of other exempt offerings or, or crowdfunding offerings that are distinctly different than the normal registered offering track. Um, so Reg CF and, and Reg A plus. Um, I don't know if it would be. I don't want to give everybody a law class here as I, of interest to talk about. Yeah, or, yeah, 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 very much. I was not hoping that was. That's a fun part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Uh, so Reg A plus, um, Reg A technically. Um, Okay, so uh, this is this is a, a, it's an offering where the issuer must actually register with the SEC, um, but it's kind of a registration light. Um, so there are there's forms that need to be provided to the commission for comment, um, but it's considerably more efficient and just a lighter, generally a lighter comment um, uh, undertaking. Um, now there are two tiers under Reg A. Um, the first tier is uh, an issuance or a raise of up to 20 million. The second is uh, up to 50 million. Um, there are a couple slight distinctions between those two tracks. Um, I guess the, the, the primary comment I would make there is um, to the extent that an issuer um, 
goes under the tier one track. Uh, they're still subject to, to state um, uh, state register well, state approval, whereas a tier two offering does not require that. Um, the the major distinction though for Reg A plus issuance versus a Reg D offering is that um, you do not need to sell to accredited investors. Um, there are uh, a percentage of income of wealth limitation on how much an investor can invest in their capital. Uh, notwithstanding that point, there are um, but the, the non-accredited investors can, can participate. If, if I can, uh, and I'll take a few minutes on this because what I find is that if we do this right, you get to save about 427 hours of trying to understand it later. And it only comes from my own frustration of trying to get my arms around securities law. The Historically, it goes like this. 1929, a whole bunch of people lose a lot of money. And in 1933, uh, we said, wait, we've got a new idea, which is if you want to sell your stock to anybody, we want you to disclose a lot of information about your company. And here's the rule. We're, we're not going to tell you what kind of company to have, but you're not allowed to make a material misstatement. That's going to be considered fraud. You're also not going to be allowed to have an omission that makes things materially untrue. That's also going to be because securities fraud. And the securities fraud is going to be punishable either by us, the federal government, or by individual people that buy your stock under this fraudulent scheme. And that's the 33 Act. So when a company goes public, what they're doing is they're preparing a statement about their company to anybody that wants to buy the stock, and hopefully not making any material misstatements or material omissions. Now, it came to pass that we realized not everybody can do this. It's a lot of work, and you don't need to do it. You don't need to protect all the people all the time. And so we started making exceptions. And the biggest exception is something that isn't a public offering. And then smart lawyers started going, well, wait a second, this is terrible. And we're not really sure when something is or isn't a public offering. And so we started with regulations to make specific exemptions. And one is one, the one that you, we're talking about, which is 506 b which is saying, you know what, if you've got accredited investors, people of a certain net worth, you make $200,000 yourself, or you and your husband make $300,000, you've got a million dollars in net worth, you know what, you guys can sell to those guys all day long. You still can't make them, you still can't lie to them, you still can't make them material open statement. But what you don't have to do is register those securities with the SEC. You don't have to put the document to this arduous thing. You might want to disclose some information about your company for a whole bunch of reasons, but you know, you're going to get an exemption. So there's other exemptions. Um, one which was kind of a backwater exemption, and I shouldn't say that because it's probably it's old people, but it wasn't used much. It was Reg A. And the reason was is because you couldn't raise them up, which was it used to be like two million to five million thresholds. So it was a lot of work and not, not, not a lot. That's been raised, what he's talking about now, to 20 million and, and 50 million. And you can do that once every 12 months. Um, it's not quite like an IPO. It's kind of like an IPO, like you do a lot of the same work in terms of preparing a circular, you have to give it to the SEC, they have to approve it, but you get to do a lot of great things about actually offering the securities, as long as you do some reporting and as long as you do some disclosures at regular times. That is my is anyone, that version of it. Has anyone been approved? No one to my knowledge has been approved on a Reg A plus for tokens. But we have secret information from the S. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I really appreciate the history that you just provided. That was, that was really helpful. And I, I kind of want to, I want to emphasize something. I think this is just echoing what, what the chair said to the Senate this morning. Um, you know, this is a disclosure-based um, framework. So it's it's not a merit-based. So the the commission's not making a determination of whether or not it's a good business model or, or good idea or good type of transaction. It is simply a function of ensuring or attempting to ensure that anyone that's going to be buying into um, buying security has the requisite amount of information that is accurate um, and complete and so they can make an informed decision. Um, and, and that's first and foremost the, the kind of the point underlying this. Um, and, and frankly, that's not entirely dissimilar from a lot of the observations um, made among the, the ICO community, where a lot of values that are espoused are in connection with thorough white papers, uh, a summary of, of the token or its attributes, um, use of the proceeds, um, a little bit about the business model and or the tech itself and the team putting it together. It, it's, it's, that's not a far departure from the things that we're talking about that already exist in our securities law framework. 
And, and we're not we're not even going that far, right? Uh, we're, what what we're trying to do for 1.0 is just get the equivalent to the front page of 10K. Uh, supply authorized and outstanding would be a hell of a place to start. Um, because you don't actually know what the inflation is for 90% of the tokens out there because there's hidden inflation in the form of vesting schedules and advisors and investors and early employees have different schedules, maybe no schedules at all. People just don't understand the hidden inflation that's kind of locked in in the long tail of these tokens that's going to hit the market over the course of the next 12 months. Um, and I pick on a couple of you know, uh, different projects that are actually, I think, doing things the right way and, and generally on the up and up. Um, just to illustrate the point, but Civic, for instance, I think ran a very democratic, uh, smart, uh, you know, best efforts token sale last summer. But I don't think a lot of people recognize that after the first calendar year, uh, a third of their treasury tokens, which is about 11% of the fully diluted supply, become liquid. What happens when they want to sell that, right? What do they have to disclose it to the token community? Do they uh, do a filing with the SEC? No, because it's not a security. Um, how do people actually know when that supply becomes liquid? Because it's not just 11 percent, 11 points out of out of the fully diluted supply. It's going to actually be more like potentially 25, 30 percent inflation overnight if they want to dump it. And then he will tell you, "Well, don't be silly. We wouldn't do that. It would crash the price and destroy the community." But the point is, they could. Right, um, and there's really no way to tell when something like that could happen. And he's one of the good guys in the industry. I like Civic. I like Benny, and, and I think he's he's a reputable guy. There are a lot of others in the industry that I'd not say the same for. Um, so, in a sentiment-driven market where there are no such things as fundamentals, maybe the next best thing that we can get that's actually going to be material uh, that we can use to self-regulate a little bit is just knowing what liquid supply is and when new liquid supply becomes outstanding and part of the float. That's a, you know, we're, we're talking about things that are so rudimentary uh, that, you know, for us, when we think about self-regulation, that they're so non-controversial that anyone that would basically say, well, we're not going to disclose that, would raise some serious red flags. And I think um, that's going to be our best chance at getting ahead of this before regulation comes from on high. Is starting non-controversial, objective, um, easy to verify, relatively static information, and, and things that really shouldn't be that hard to get, but just aren't available anywhere today. I, I think that's right. In the in the hearing today, there was bipartisan concern, and you, you hardly see them agreeing. And they want to actually fund the agencies to kind of fight cryptocurrency. Is the message that I got. So I do think regulation is going to come down. The only um, person that I think spoke against kind of dis a disclosure-based regime was uh, Representative Kennedy. Um, but other than that, I heard no support, you know, outside of that. So the, the more we can self-regulate and think about ways that we can show, you know, there's transparency in this market and there is information out there, I think, the better. Was Kennedy the one who asked uh, Chairman Clayton if you read the disclosures the last time he purchased? He asked Giancarlo that. Yes, Giancarlo that. Okay. Yeah. 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 If you didn't, if you didn't catch it, um, uh, one of the members of the committee asked the head of the CFTC uh, what was the last security that he bought, and he said it was a mutual fund. And he asked him, did he did he receive the disclosure? And you could see him just kind of be like, yes, I know where this is going. And the, and the person asked, and did you read the entire thing? And he was like, no, I didn't. And that led to a whole discussion about. Does it matter? Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. Well, and, and I think that kind of illustrates the point, right? It, it, you, uh, no one reads the 10K. No one reads, you know, certain, if they read the 10K, they certainly don't look at the risk factors because it's just a, a million uh, risk factors of legalese. You know, basically a comet could fall from the sky and, and kill everybody in the office, and, and so that's a risk. And, 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 and I think you know, because there's no prioritization of what is actually material and what is a likely risk, and there's no scoring because it's just something that's old and stodgy and, and, and kind of top down, I don't think you're gonna get much um, innovation from the SEC or, or you know, any equivalent regulator nationally. More of this that we can do that's kind of by the spirit uh, and within the spirit and, and guidelines that are already uh, in existence, I would argue that the industry should be able to do a better job. And I think the top projects generally have ethos of transparency and, and a willingness to bring a lot of this to the fore and, and ultimately compete long term on uh, the viability of the tech that they're building. Let's let the cream rise to the top. 
Yeah, and so like one of the reasons why I wanted to go over some fairly dry uh, subject matter is that you know I've, I've spoken with a lot of people who are interested in, in blockchain products, and a lot of people don't know that these exemptions exist. Like they, they only see two paths. One is let's just sell it, and the other is let's go to Switzerland and make a Swiss foundation, or let's go offshore someplace and maybe that will work out for us. Um, but so really, you know, kind of uh, explaining to people that no, there are these other ways to do it. Um, a lot of people, you know, aren't even aware of that. 